My turn? This entire podcast, My turn to go? this entire episode of Press Fly Z is going to be entirely done in pantomime. Sorry. Yeah, to, that's how we do it. Sorry, sorry to spoil you folks. I, I closed a tab on my screen and I was not paying attention. It's fine. Hello and welcome to an all new episode of Press YYZ, your favorite Canadian gaming podcast. You can catch the show weekly on youtube.com slash press YYZ, live on twitch.com tv slash press yyz wednesdays at 8 p.m eastern or on your own time on your podcast service of choice before we get started a reminder as always that we here at press yyz stand against discrimination of any kind while we and while we appreciate however you choose to back our show there's no better way to support us than by being excellent to each other uh yeah uh i i am my head is clearly in the clouds uh i am your host aj fraser for tonight i am joined by the wonderful alexander cozina how are you doing hello 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 e3 what a show uh i am also joined by nathan mcinerney yo i'm glad to be here tonight just for this night though all the others i'm kind of disappointed in myself oh i mean that's typical well, what about what about episodes of Press YZ that we had during the day? Are those also exempt? No, those are fine. Okay, those there ones we are go. good. Then you guys about... start recording earlier. Hmm, Maybe uh, that other voice you hear is is a special guest. Why don't you introduce yourself? I am Tucker Hazel. Uh, I was called upon by the gods of Press YYZ to join for a post E3 discussion. Um, I'm from Backlog Banter, a YouTube channel that uh, makes gaming content, believe it or not. I know that's a crazy concept, what but uh, what is gaming content? Oh, yeah, I, what is gaming? I don't understand. Yeah, there's YouTube, there's games. We'll, we'll figure it out throughout this discussion. But um, I'm enough. very excited to talk about E3, regardless of if the showing was actually as exciting as it could have been. Well, I I think it may have been. I think it may have been, but we'll see. We'll get into that in just a sec. Uh, we got a little bit of housekeeping we got to uh, catch up on here uh, really quick. Um, yeah, so uh, we did a ton of E3 live reactions. Uh, you can check them out on YouTube and the Twitch archives. I participated in the uh, Xbox briefing and the uh, Square Enix briefing, um, and Cozy and Nathan held down the fort on what el what else did you guys do? Nintendo. Yep, the uh, Nintendo yep. Direct with a friend of the show, uh, Kyle, aka Darth Summer Stratus, Game Fest. And Summer Game Fest, of course. Can't forget about that one. The, the problem with this year's E3 is that it went on for so long and for, like, not only did it go on for so long, but also like so much of it was just droughts that weren't that appealing that yeah. you kind of, yeah. you, you tend to kind of forget what didn't, didn't happen. But uh, the two press conferences we did react to were pretty good. Yeah. Ab yeah, absolutely. Um, I tuned in to some, some good, I, of the ones I tuned into, I'm not necessarily disappointed in, in the rest of the, the results of those. Um, yeah. Second piece of housekeeping. Uh, Nathan, uh, you're going to be playing some Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart uh, and finishing it live on stream on Thursday? I'm hoping I'm finishing it. I feel like I'm close to the end of the game. Um, this is longer than I think most Ratchets have felt to me. Uh, which is good. There's a lot of um, stuff to it. I'm enjoying myself with it. So I think I'll be finishing it. Um, I hope I don't finish it tonight because then I would have blown my load really early. Uh, yeah, don't do that. Nobody likes yeah. that. No. Um, but uh, if not, I'll be doing challenge mode tomorrow and cleaning Ooh. up uh, getting this, getting the platinum. So if I, if I happen to accidentally finish it tonight, because uh, I don't know, like it's a game. You never know how much you have left to play, right? So... Yeah, I feel like I'm close to being done. So, and it's yeah. really good. But... Good to hear. Good to hear. I have personally not started yet. I don't actually have my PS5 with me. I'm at home on vacation currently. Uh, I, I lived in Texas, but I go to college in Nebraska. So I don't have my PlayStation. But as soon as I get back to my house in Nebraska, I'm going to be starting it. Mm -hmm. I'm very excited. Fun stuff. Uh, yeah, and one, one last piece of uh, housekeeping cozy. Hmm. You are going to be dropping into Warzone. 
Yeah, uh, Warzone is a game that I played many times in the past, and seeing as how there is a new season out by now, is it out by now? They talked about a new season during E3, and so I figured, you know what, what better time than to jump back into Warzone than to do so uh, this upcoming Monday. Uh, so tune in this upcoming Monday, uh, that's going to be June 21st at 8pm EST, to watch me play some Warzone with some extra special friends. TBD on who those friends are. Of course, of course. Um, yeah, and so, yeah, I guess that's going to do it for uh, housekeeping. Anybody? What? What do we? Okay, we're today's topic Indeed, of the right. show. We're going to do a full recap of E3, but before we do that, I suppose um, I think it would be a good idea to kind of get everybody's first last whatever overall reaction to the the show as a whole and how how everything went down just just from your own perspective tucker let let's start with you how was e how was the christmas for gamers for you i look at e3 in a very interesting way in that honestly on the whole most shows i'm gonna be watching them i'm gonna tune out for a good solid majority of it but when i look back at an e3 overall every showcase that i watched every conference every announcement i'm just looking for those diamonds in the rough those few announcements for games that i can't wait to pick up that i'm going to be following their their trailers and re-watching reactions and all of that and there were a handful of them this year but for me those were few and far between and the amount of padding that this year had as i'm sure we're going to get into was kind of overkill considering how many different showcases we had and how many of them kind of under delivered in terms of of actual announcements yeah so, i don't know um, i was pretty disappointed over it's it's hard to to kind of wrap your head around it because e3 in in my mind is a very particular experience. Um, I was lucky enough in 2013, uh, I didn't g go to E3, but uh, behind me here in this uh, lovely image, this is the E3 stage for um, EA. Uh, my friend Ben got me into um, the E3 show that year, just just for um, just for the, the, the press conference there. That's the one where they first revealed um, battlefront and they first revealed um a sequel to mirror's edge mm. um some reasonable yeah. announcements there then yeah for there, there, were, there were yeah it was for an ea conference especially yeah, exactly. they, and they i remember them they spoke at, at that one not not to go too into the weeds on past e3s we've done that a few times here um i remember they spoke about how they had two engines frostbite was going to be used for everything uh, um except for sports sports was going to be the ignite engine it was going to be this big deal um so they had fire and ice um because uh, that make makes sense i guess but um how much, drake came out on stage do you remember how much time during that press conference they specifically talked about the two engines I don't. It's not I think, great conference fodder. I'm not gonna. Be, I'm gonna be honest. Uh, I mean, the P, yeah, the P, Well, it, I guess it depends, right? Because a media briefing is for the media to release it that information to the public. Did they announce? Uh, did they announce Rory McIlroy's PGA Tour at that one? And talk about the uh, revolutions with it. I don't think they. I don't think it was that one. Um, I know, um, what's his name? He's the head of UFC. Uh, he Dana, came out on stage. Dana Car no, not yeah. Dana Carvey. Dana, yeah, Dana, 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 Dana Carvey. Dana Carvey, that's the one. <laughs> um, <laughs> a little mistake there, but... Yeah, turtle, bro. Um, the other Dana. Yeah. Um, he came out on stage with a couple other UFC fighters. Drake came out on stage, and um, the guy who played Jesse Pinkman in Breaking Bad. Aaron uh, Paul. Aaron Paul. Uh, yeah, he came out on stage for that Need for Speed thing he was doing. It was a good time. Great movie. Um, but I digress. Uh, that that was... Actually, one more fun fact. This was the stage. Um, Pete, so Peter Moore walked right past us uh, while we were sitting in our seats. He goes up on stage and, and just kind of preps everybody before the show starts. And... He he said, "Longtime vets of you know of the media industry may remember this stage 
from many years ago. Um, and he gestured to his arm. So that was the same stage that Peter Moore, when he worked at Xbox, rolled up his sleeve and revealed the date for uh, Halo 2, November 9th, uh, 2004, on his, that he fake tattooed on his arm. Um, but I digress. Very interesting um, real date. Yeah. Not I, familiar with that, that particular reveal, but I mean, that sounds like that, an E3 pop uh, memorable moment. It was... It was up there with the Twilight Princess reveal when they revealed that same year that it was uh, going to be a little more realistic gra- graphics and stuff. Yeah. But anyway, uh, Nathan, how was the show for you? So I think like a lot of people, I found that like and even just going over our run of show today, we had way too many events. It was too spread out. Um uh, Andy uh, Cortez from Kind of Funny had a great tweet where he basically said, "Just because you could can do it doesn't mean you should do it." Mm-hmm. And I think that really puts a lot of these events down. Um, like, was it a blockbuster E three? No, we had one or two great showcases, maybe one great showcase and a few okay showcases, um, and a lot of really bad ones. And I think mm-hmm. that's what this year is going to be remembered by is probably because you always somehow remember the bad more than you do the good sometimes. And I can see that sticking around for a lot longer. Um, like everybody still remembers that bad Xbox conference from 2012 when they announced the Xbox one. Yeah. 2013. Yeah. Or was that was, 13? That was this yeah. same year. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Actually, the 2013. That, that happened in, in May of that year. And then they came to E3 and that's where shit really hit the fan. And a few days later, they backtracked on some of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Sony mm-hmm. ate their lunch heartily. Oh, that. Don Matrick should not have been in charge. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> like, was it. I don't know. Like, we'll see what E3 looks like next year. I'm still not convinced we need E3, mm-hmm. uh, um, especially okay. if it's going to be run like this. Um, Sony is going to do an event later this in the summer, most likely. And I'm curious to see what the numbers look like that on later in the year or later in the summer and what doing their own thing versus having all of this news in one week versus having an entire news cycle to yourself. I, okay. In E3's past, when it was all condensed into the one thing, I always felt like there was what, like, regardless of what place I went to one place I could go and I could see all of the updates, right? Like regardless of, you know, what website I wanted to go to, I could go to one place on that website and see everything. Yep. But even, even though like you could theoretically, there could be an E3 page or, and there could be a summer games fest page where they summarize all, all, all of everything. I feel like, even that, even though it all happened around the same week, right now is just all too spread out. It, it's it's hard to articulate. It, it's it just feels so watered down. Like I, I had no real way of. I mean, if I if I tried a little harder, I'm sure I could have found all the information I was looking for, but I didn't feel it as easy this year to try and keep up with all the information that was coming out. Like I have in years past. Yeah. Well, there was so much information. I think part of it is too, with so many conferences, there's so many different web pages you would need to access to see what came out and what didn't come out. And then you have it watered down too, at the same time, because there's so many, like there were too many indie presentations and don't get me wrong. I love indie games, Mm -hmm. but we need to find a way to consolidate that. Yeah, and have like yeah. one big presentation. Um, I get that there's like I don't even understand. Like we had a future gaming showcase, the Gorilla Collective Live, Day of the Devs, oh, an we'll indie gaming showcase. We will get into it. Trust me. Um, but like, and we can talk about it because none of us have anything written for almost any of those things because they just kind of exactly. come and go. Um, like come and go and i'm sure there's games in there that we want to see and this is kind of one of those things where if we space some of this stuff out throughout the like throughout the summer or throughout the year instead of cramming it all into one week it would have a longer news cycle to breathe 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. If Gorilla mm-hmm. Gorilla Collective did their event in July, like it would have room yeah. to breathe. The games that come out would have a chance. And that's why I'm okay with so like people skipping on E3 because it gives them their chance to have their own ch- spot in the cycle. Yeah. Like, and even we can talk about how ac- great Xbox was and Xbox it will come to it, had a great showcase, but days later, Nintendo does theirs. And like, are, we'll still talk about Xbox showcase, but you've already lost that new cycle to Nintendo. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, it, uh, yeah. Think back to last year's summer game mess and everything, everyone just doing their things and, and, and Sony and Microsoft and all, everyone starting to do online essentially directs for their own content it this it being spaced out was interesting because it had never been done like that before in terms of we're so used to e3 being concentrated but it was fun to be able to have discussions and from my perspective make videos about things at a more consistent rate rather than cramming everything into four days because i had a hell of a time recording the reactions and discussions and putting out bam 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 content and and that's obviously a content creator's perspective on it but i think overall E3 is a lot of fun in terms of the industry gathering around and having a time where you can just nerd out about video games, no questions asked, but mm-hmm. I prefer being able to focus on things. And the hype around E3, I think, kind of led to a lot of co- uh, conferences being on rolling because people expect so much. When someone's at E3, they expect those killer announcements. And when Square and Capcom just show the games that they're working on and there's nothing particularly top tier it leads to disappointment. And, and I think if they had, you know, consolidated, it wouldn't be as big of an issue. Yeah. Um, also, who is the time in the day to watch all these conferences? Like, yeah, unless exactly. you're streaming professionally, um, like it, it, a lot of it was on weekend, but some of these were during the weekdays. Um, and there's just so much going on. Like I can't fathom. I'm an old man now with kids. Um, and, like I don't two of my kids are away at my parents' cottage and I still couldn't watch everyone if I wanted to. Mm-hmm. So once again, it comes out to let's space it out a little more and see what we can do. Anyways, so we haven't are, heard any in see. the uh, run of show document, just uh, for the record, there are like a total of 17 different uh, presentations that we're going to, you know, in some cases skim through and other cases go into extensively. And those 17 aren't even all the like showcases that were at E3. There were like a lot of yeah. like really weirdly timed ones that were happening in the dead of the middle of the night underneath the blood moon, you know, in inverted wow. time at the 25th hour, the sacred hour. In the upside down. <laughs> yeah, in the upside down. Yep. Cozy, what were your overall thoughts I mean, of I, E3? I, I echo a lot of what the three of you have already said. Um, uh, I do want to say, you know, I, I've thought about it a lot and I feel like the uh, announcements uh that we got at this e3 the like girth of announcements you could say uh i would Go say on. is not great way that, to say that great great verbiage there not yeah it's fantastic it's not that much uh i would say lesser than what we would typically get at your average e3 it is just because again things were not very well consolidated because uh every yeah. single uh publisher under the world decided to host uh their own press conference that it you know felt so tiring and so kind of chaotic and disorganized um and so i think i just want to say that to kind of keep things in perspective of like in terms of like uh, announcements i feel like if this e3 was just reorganized reworked a little bit like I think we would actually be sitting here saying, oh, man, in, in uh, overall, in terms of quality content, this was a solid E3, some ups, some downs, yeah. but overall, like not that bad at all compared to some prior ones. Obviously, the loss of Sony, you know, is notable. But other than that, yeah. uh, it's a good E3 overall in terms of uh, announcements that was just presented really awkwardly. No, I definitely agree. I think that things like Square's conference, people coming off of that being a little bit negative, if Gar- if, Sony, if Sony was here, we're hypothetically projecting into a future that did not exist or a past that didn't exist. If if Sony was there and Stranger of Paradise and Guardians of the Galaxy had shown up at that and they didn't have to deal with the space being in the Square conference or if Capcom had shown their Monster Hunter Stories Troop trailer only at Nintendo and not had their own thing and there was a section about... Uh, Ace Attorney at Nintendo or something like that, people would be happy with it. Instead, 
having it be its own thing, it feels, okay, well, these announcements aren't substantive enough to warrant showing up for their own showcase. But I, I think that the content, you're right, was there. It was just the formatting. Um, I was listening to Tim on Kind of Funny uh, talk the other day, and he had a valid point, too. These videos and a lot of these like packages weren't put together well. And at this point, the companies have had more than a year to figure out how to do this. And he said, at the end of the day, you need to watch and say, is this something I want to watch? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And the fact that some people felt yes to that, like speaks volumes about where they need to be. I don't think they doing. even asked themselves that question for certain presentations. Um, and, and I'm sure we might disagree on some of those presentations. Um, yeah. But I, there's one in particular in this whole list that I think we can all <laughs> safely say was a ab absolute disaster. Just yeah. one. I, th um, I think there's more than one. So I agree. I agree. Well, maybe. I, I mean, uh, without further ado, why not we yeah. dive right into things? So let's uh, do it. The first major presentation of note at E3 2021 was Jeff Keighley's Summer Games Fest kickoff live. Um, at E3. You got to get the air quotes in there because, of course, he's not technically affiliated with E3, but this definitely did kick off the season. Sure. A very, very yeah. good point. Um and, you know, we got quite a few announcements uh, of note at this one. Overall, it was a good presentation. Uh, you know, not everything was for everyone. Uh, but I would say that in terms of just presenting things well, it definitely ticked the boss box in that case. Um, for me, yeah. the, the biggest announcement of consequence uh, from that show was uh, the director's cut of Death Stranding being announced. And I haven't even... Uh, like completed Death Stranding. So I need to get around to that at some point. Um, but that was pretty appealing to me and I'm definitely looking forward to seeing what that nets out to be. Um, we also, however, got an announcement of Tiny Tina's Wonderlands at that presentation as well, which I know, Nathan, you want to talk about a little bit. Yeah, um, I don't know enough about it yet because I want to understand more, but I'm more for something in this is Borderlands universe because it has Tiny Tina in it. Um, looks to be using the same art style. It's got a fantastic voice cast featuring Andy Samberg, Wanda Sykes, and Will Arnett, hmm. um, which are like top tier voice acting talent. Uh, so I'm very curious to see what this is. It looks more like an expanded take on the Borderlands 2 Dungeons and Dragons expansion. Yeah, Tiny Tina's mm -hmm. Assault on Dragon's Keep. Yes. Um, so I'm down for that. And if this is more like you're creating an RPG character, um, I saw Randy Pitchford basically pitching this as he's always wanted to do an RPG um, and never been allowed to do it. So this is kind of kind of give him the opportunity to do an RPG while still mixing it with some of the Borderlands flair. Sure. So I'm curious what that looks like. That's kind of a weird way for him to describe it like that, because the Borderlands series always hung its hat on the fact that, hey, we have RPG elements backing up our looter shooter based combat. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, no, I'm, I, I'm interested to see what this looks like. Um, also it has butt stallion. So like you can't lose. Yeah. It's kind of amazing. Cause butt stallion originally started off as a purely like non-visual joke in borderlands two, And now butt stallions, a, a main character in a video game. Mm hmm. And Ashley Birch is fantastic as Tiny Tina. I just wish we would have seen more at the Gearbox conference. Right. But they showed the exact same thing. Well, well That's very we're, interesting. We're, we're about 12 press conferences uh, ahead of us. So <laughs> let's just focus on the rest of these Summer Games kickoff live. Tucker, okay. I know that uh, you and I'm sure that, you know, the rest of us all have a little bit to say about Elden Ring, which was the big announcement that capped off the Summer Games Fest kickoff live non E3 slash kind of E3 presentation. Yeah, 100%. And I think that the thing about Elden Ring and Honestly, from my opinion, and looking back on what the entire last week of games announcements was, it's really Elden Ring, uh, Xbox in the middle, and then end with Nintendo. And of course, those are three big pillars to to land on. But um, when I was hearing about what I didn't watch this conference live, but I was catching what was happening and people were talking about a few things. It was really Elden Ring that captured the attention of the of the Internet, of Twitter, where I was looking, especially. Um, and 
as someone who has recently become a fan of Souls games and, and the stuff that Miyazaki does, I I can't wait for this game. I mean, it sounds like a dream come true. And this was a absolutely fantastic trailer from looking at the art style and, and the creature design is absolutely fantastic. And just the idea of having a horse in an open world with this combat that is clearly quite expanded, it's it's fantastic. And I can't wait to see more of it. And I'm surprised we didn't see more of it at... Uh, uh, an an echo. Yeah, but um, yeah. I, I thought this was an amazing trailer and a great way to sort of prove that Jeff Keighley has this industry pull. He can say, hey, Miyazaki gave me the trailer to one of the most anticipated games of the generation, especially the last few years. And we finally saw the game and basically everything we wanted to see from it. It's interesting because a big trend at this year's E3 is that you saw many games, especially in the indie sphere, uh, appear many times at many different presentations. Um, yep. uh, yet this game, which I think a lot of people would have said uh, they would have wanted to see more of, like only appeared at Summer Games Fest kickoff live. And, you know, on, mm-hmm. on one hand, that definitely made it feel a lot more special. That's something, you know, about jeff Keeley's presentation that only his presentation did that he can hang his hat on uh yeah. but i guess i guess yeah a little bit surprising in that regard we can talk about our thoughts when we get to the bandai namco conference yeah that's a good point uh any other games to come out of this presentation that we wanted to highlight nope all right well in that case let's move on to uh the second major presentation uh of e3 uh which was the day of the devs presentation uh day of the devs 2021 um i i had heard of this like day of the devs um stuff beforehand i didn't know that this thing had been going on for 10 years which is like a presentation yep. hosted by double fine where they kind of show off a bunch of cool indie talent uh from throughout the industry and the world uh and Go ahead. The guy who used to put it together for Double Fine now works for PlayStation, I believe, in indie development. Mm. In uh, finding indies. So interesting. This was a a good presentation. I, I watched this one. I feel like it went along at a pretty good clip, and that I thought that the quality of games shown off, while not everything was appealing to me, um, was uh, of a pretty good quality. Uh, I know, Nathan, uh, you personally were very, very excited to see Axiom Verge 2 show up at this particular presentation. Yeah, so, like, it's no surprise. I've talked many times about my love of Axiom Verge, uh, the first game. It was my game of the year in 2015. Um, It is probably my favorite Metroidvania, including Metroids. Okay. Um, And at a time... It did Metroid when Nintendo wouldn't. Yeah. It, it, this really was a spiritual successor to Metroid in a lot of ways and how it was designed um, with a lot of love um, going back to that. So Axiom Verge 2, I have been steadily waiting on. Uh, this is actually um, the last Axiom Verge took place in a different like uh, um, dimension and this one is not and it's starting a different character not trace it's a new character a girl instead of focusing on guns and stuff this is going to focus on melee combat huh so it looks like it feels like very different while retaining a lot of the stuff it's in the same universe as that last axiom verge and there's apparently a whole universe to tell now this entire game is developed by one person yeah Mm -hmm. like um, that's why I have no problem waiting for for this. Um, but it looks very interesting. Um, I love the first Axe and Verge. I love what they did with it. I love kind of how you could hack games. And this one looks to be more, or hack games, hack enemies and hack parts of the world. Um, so the visual style was really good. I think this is a gorgeous 2D platformer. I'm very excited about what we're seeing here. Also, some of the accessibility stuff. So the PS5 version apparently might be delayed a little bit because it's coming to all of them because they're trying to make sure that they use all the PS4 or PS5 help for the action cards and everything. Oh, that's going very through it. Nice. Also, yeah. you can skip bosses. If you're finding a boss too hard and you huh. can't get through it, there's an ability to just go past them and not even do it. That's awesome. So, I mean, 
as someone who is only recently come around to challenging video games, I play everything on very easy difficulties. I, I play for mechanics and story and, you know, world and stuff like that. But it's always great to hear games that really take accessibility to the next level and allow people to play the game and experience the entire thing without the hindrance of, of, of challenge that might become frustrating to them. You hear about Celeste, and that's a, the amazing uh, accessibility options in there. Um, uh, Last of Us 2. They're these games that are really taking accessibility to the next level and seeing so, someone that is developing an entire game by himself do this should set the bar properly for especially AAA developers to say, look, this can be something that should be a standard and let everyone experience your games regardless of of their skill level. Yeah, so I'm really curious to see what this looks like because I know a lot of people found the first Axiom Verge to be difficult as it's kind of like Contra and Metroid mixed together in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Um uh, near the end of that game, you can just breeze through every area because you've got all the weapons and powered them up. But anyways, so yeah, no, I don't want to take too much time on it. I'm super excited. It's coming in the summer at some point. I don't think we've got an exact date yet, um, but this should be a great game to play. All right. Um, after that, we had the Netflix uh, Geeked Week uh, presentation where Netflix showed off a lot of uh video game themed shows are coming to the platform um including uh, a lot of ubisoft shows surprisingly uh including one that is like a standard far cry show and one that's a blood dragon inspired show uh however uh, nathan sorry go ahead no i was just gonna say i didn't even know this happened to be honest i mean i i wasn't watching presentations at this point in time when this happened but I didn't hear anyone talk about this at all. So it'd be interesting to hear what your thoughts are. This is very much one of those presentations that I caught partially after the fact because uh, kind of funny streamed uh, their reactions to it. Like, I, like I, sure. I, I wouldn't have otherwise like seen it live, but because kind of funny did their reactions, I'm like, oh, I'm going to want to check this out. Um, however, Nathan, you actually have a little bit to say about the one, like not exactly video game uh, related show that was shown off at Netflix Geek Week, which is the new uh, Masters of the Universe He-Man revival. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if you guys know this, but I'm really old. And hence being really old, no. I grew up with the original He-Man in the 80s. I can't believe it. Uh, Disgusting. Chicken. And Disgusting. If I could be honest with you guys, he old eighties cartoons sucked. I thought they were good when I was a kid, but going back to them is really, really hard to do now. Sure. Uh, trying to show them to my kids, there's so much better quality stuff. Like watching old DuckTales versus that new DuckTales show is just like night and day. Mm. So they've learned so much uh, from cartoons. And watching this trailer, you have we can't air the sound for it because we'll get a copyright strike. But it's um, uh, the same. To be fair, we might still. Days. Yeah. Oh, that's true. We we got uh, a copyright strike because of that WWE that, mobile game that we. Yes. Had on it, to be fair, it, yeah. it wasn't strike. It wasn't a strike. It was yeah. just a claim where exactly. you know it was blocked in some countries. But oh. you know, um, but yeah, no this this looks to be fantastic. It's uh, produced by Kevin Smith, hmm. right? Which I like his content on. It's got a fantastic voice cast. Um, actually, I should have pulled the voice cast up for it um give me two seconds i mean just from looking at the animation here uh that that because it's got pulled up and uh, i'm i like the animation style i'm not familiar with master of the universe i mean i, I know the character of he-man but um i i have no expectations going into this but I, it might be something i check out there's a really great yeah. live action movie that you should check out it, it explains everything oh. you need to know about that's a little bit sarcastic lena headley um alicia silverstone justin lawn jason Mewes, kevin conroy um uh, sarah michelle geller mark hamill who's uh jason Mewes voicing is he voicing um, he is voicing stinkor the skunk uh, character wait wait uh do i have him here d does he does he still bit of, smell bit of prop comedy all these years Got the green lantern boxers shout out to those oh those are boxers those are my pajama pants nope oh, okay yeah, we here at uh, PressYZ run a family-friendly show. Sure. Yes. Yeah. I don't want to get banned on Twitch. Okay, of well, course. I don't know where it is, Bullshit. but this is... I, I've got prompts. This is my Battle Cat figure mm. without the armor, so it's actually just make, Cringor. Make him full screen, Cozy. Uh, yeah, let me do that real quick right here. Um, a little bit of the OBS oh. magic. Uh -oh. Yeah. Uh oh, you broke it. 
Well, yeah. broke it. Uh oh. That's not easy. Let me let me see if I can do it manually. Right now, it's just showing the sun from Mass Effect, um, from from Mass Effect Two. Two that the elusive man is in front of. Here we go. Oh, yeah, there we oh, go. That was oh, there you go. <laughs> That's there my cringor. Um, I don't have the armor. I picked him up at a garage sale years ago, and I never let go of him. And this is a later figure in the He-Man line, and this is a character called Tunlasher. T-U-N-G under uh, L-A-S-H-O-R. And if you wheel on his back, his oh, tongue sticks out. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, um, he uh, is very uh, giving, unlike Batman, apparently. <laughs> got so, him oh, thumbs up for his tongue lashing <laughs> hell yeah um, he is not a hero that's where my internet handle came from when I was a uh, teenager because I thought that was a cool name tongue lasher uh, uh, so that was my internet handle and everything and then when adults read it they choice. were like that's interesting and um, I was dumb and didn't understand why they thought it was interesting for a long time so go me <sighs> you go back to that go back so thus far, all the presentations that we've talked about, the Summer Games Fest kickoff live, Day of the Devs 2021, Netflix Geeked Week, uh, all these presentations were, you know, pretty well received for what they were. Uh, you know, again, spreading out a lot of the games that would otherwise be consolidated into fewer uh, presentations on an average E3, but still, yeah. you know, uh, enjoyable watches in their own right. Uh, but then after Netflix Geeked Week, uh, we got the cock or coach or Koch Media primetime presentation. Uh, no idea how to pronounce it. I ah. mean, I, I'm, I'm going to... The problem, right, is that in the presentation, people who they have, who, who they interview to talk about their games and uh, their lives, like, pronounce the name itself in all sorts of weird, unusual ways. I'd like to believe that the most proper pronunciation is Coke, like yeah. the soda, but... I, I, I suppose that it, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, uh, no idea. Pro probably not. Um, yeah. Uh, the, okay. Don't don't watch this conference if you're still trying to get caught up on E3. You, I, I will, I will give you permission to watch somebody else react to this conference, um, but. Um, yeah, I, I watch Kind of Funny uh, do their reactions to it because, you know, they under the promise that there would be something here. It was a giant series of basically just interviews with developers and TED Talks, like something something more akin to like a GDC, but like not as technical or in-depth. And it was a lot of the interview you have on screen right now, like they didn't even put the care in to tell him to move his camera around yeah like a lot of headroom there buddy a lot yeah. of headroom just, like just sit in his room yeah like it uh it's no production value i think is what is, is what you're trying to get at they they tried to make a big deal of this thing that they're doing with games and then they threw zero money at it mm. it does yeah. it just didn't well no they threw they threw some money at jeff Keeley and got him involved to to kind of talk a little bit in between some of the segments but yeah it was rough absolutely rough yeah obviously uh, we all here you know have a fun this for kind of funny uh, this particular e3 week like i really do have to hand it to them because you know we here at press YZ, we reacted to the nintendo stream we reacted to the uh, summer games fest kickoff live we reacted to microsoft kind of funny basically did every single press conference presentation big or small so yeah shout out to him for enduring this go watch uh their reaction if you think that's impressive because they definitely they do their best to make it a they, fun time they endured that is for sure and they it showed here <laughs> yep. yeah uh after that we had the wholesome direct uh, where we saw quite a few indie games with a very kind of wholesome aesthetic to them. Uh, I caught this one as well, and nothing particularly spoke to me, but presentation-wise, I thought that it was totally competent and decent. 
uh, you know, in, in the same, I would say, league as something like the Day of the Devs presentation from the day prior. I don't know if anyone else here caught it. No. No, no. I didn't watch that one. The indie stuff is interesting to me because in terms of indie announcements, I'm used to really only getting the big stuff from uh, states of, State of Plays, Nintendo Directs, and of course the Nintendo Indie World that they do occasionally. Um, but the stuff that is going to hit, uh, I think, will end up floating to the top and will be percolated elsewhere. So I will find out about it inevitably. But um, it's interesting that they have so many indie showcases here. We were talking about that a little bit earlier. Of course, develop, uh, developers got their own thing, but we've already gone through two indie showcases, and I don't even think I heard about any of the announcements for any of them. I don't even remember hearing anything about uh, Action Verse 2, nothing against it, but uh, people just weren't talking about it. This is not the first Wholesome Direct that they've aired. I believe, I'd like to say that they actually held like a Wholesome Direct, not at last year's E3, because there was no E3, but like around the same time. So I yeah. think it, it, the, the, the cachet of it having previously aired, I think, is what kind of cued it onto my radar. Um, after that, we had the Guerrilla Collective live uh, presentation where they showed off a variety of games, both indie and triple, triple, double A ish in scope. Um, this is another one of those presentations where you had a lot of double dipping, a lot of games that had showed up previously at things like the Summer Games Fest kickoff live uh, show off again. Um, nothing again that particularly stood out from this one, to be totally honest. I don't know if anyone yeah. else here. Yeah. Uh, no. And then after that, of course, we had the Ubisoft Forward 2021 presentation, which um, people had pretty deflated feelings on after it aired. But overall, I thought was totally fine for what it was, which was an opportunity to show off, um, you know, what's currently up on Ubisoft slate for the next year or so. You know, a lot of people complained about how, Ubisoft's catalog of games all kind of follow the open world Far Cry formula of there's a bunch of icons on the map and there are towers that you got to yeah. go up and activate to see what's around you. And uh, Tim Geddes is kind of funny pointed out, I believe that like it's kind of neat that at this particular Ubisoft uh, presentation, uh, they showed off a real wide variety of games that really like across the board did not fit into that mold. Um uh, on the other hand, it is a little bit disappointing that Ubisoft has still not yet kind of addressed many of the allegations of misconduct that have been levied against the company in a kind of public facing capacity uh, like this particular Ubisoft forward. Um, but we did get some cool things at it all the same, uh, like Riders Republic, which I know, Nathan, you wanted to talk a little bit about. Yeah, um, just quickly on the Ubisoft forward, I think it was too long, and I think they need to do a better job of mixing devs talking with gameplay Yeah, mm. at the same time, instead of doing, because they seem to follow this pattern of devs talking, then gameplay later. Um, and I'd like to see some of that interspliced together to shorten it up. I like hearing the devs talk. But I feel like, especially that Rainbow Six, uh, it's not quarantine, extraction. 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 Yeah. Rainbow Six extraction. Um, like, it just felt like it went on forever. Um, that, that was a common theme with some of my complaints about E3 this year. Um, but yeah, no, my big thing, uh, Riders Republic, I think it looks fantastic. Um, I'm a big Tony Hawk fan. Platinum did twice earlier this year. Wow. Um, so I like... Um, I like extreme sports and this looks right up there. My one big worry about it is that it's going to feel like there's so many different types of ways you can get around that. Are they all going to feel unique? Um, unique. Yeah. So, and, and that's what I'm curious about. Well, what I'm curious about uh, for me personally is like, you know, you have something like uh, a skateboard and then you have a bike and then you have a BMX bike and then you have a, a ski do and like, you know, is one going to feel distinctly slower than the others, or are they all going to be kind of souped up so that they're about as fast? So it's hard it's enough to impossible. make one good game about a type of transportation. Mm -hmm. like, Can we make a good this... game with this many types? Mm. Okay, well, listen, Diddy Kong Racing still exists, all right? Um, but this this game looks good. Um is it just a mix between like the crew and what was Deep. it steep from yeah. last year, the year before? 
Is it Man, just remix? Like 2016. I what? think this no. might be done steep. by the steep steep team. Steep came um, out more recently than that. The, the I never steep team. I'll double check recently. that, but the Steam. Hold on. No, steep. Steep. Uh, December second, twenty sixteen. Yeah, I remember that because it was shown off in sizzle reel at the January Switch reveal conference, and then it didn't come to Switch, which is funny. But uh, I remember that being strange. What, what happened? Nope, never came out. <laughs> I, they just didn't talk about it. They uh, they just never released it. So I don't know. It, like, there's a lot of cool types of transportation in it. Um, this has the potential to be really cool. I just worry with like, like you, uh, with all the methods you can get around cozy that you mentioned. Like, we didn't bring up the flying suits and the jetpacks. Oh yeah, that come up later. That's even more different than the, those other kinds of transportation. The, the that's, a, that's an entire other. Yeah, dimension. the Michael Bay Transformers three squirrel suits. Can't forget. About yeah, those. So, there they are. Wow. But here's um, the thing. Regardless, this looks very good. It, like, the lighting looks fantastic, um, and, and I, I like the sort of semi-cartoony graphical style. Uh, I, I hope this game is great. It just does come down to if every form of transportation, of course, they're going for variety, but if they all are actually fully fleshed out. Yeah. So, I don't know. Fingers crossed it... Uh... Um, turns out good. Uh, it's coming out September 2nd, almost, uh, like eight or nine months after it was supposed to come out. So hopefully they've had enough time to polish it and get it to where it needs to be. And everything feels good. Hmm. Uh, another big game that came out of the Ubisoft presentation, uh, that I feel like all of us, uh, probably have a little bit to say about is the sequel to Mario plus Rabid's Kingdom Battle, uh, Mario plus Rabid's, uh, Sparks of Hope. I almost singularize the Rabids in the title, and that is incorrect. Uh, I have the trailer pulled up right here, and I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, I uh, This is one of my predictions ahead of this year's E3, and more than just it being something that I predicted, I really am going to dig into this game and have a good time with it, because the original game was good with some you know small little things that could have been tweaked a little bit better, and this looks like it really you know, it addresses those tweaks quite well. I, d I just like giving Mario guns. That's yeah. true. It's always fun. <laughs> yeah. Seeing Miyamoto at, on the uh, E3 2017 stage at Ubisoft with a gun, like, leaning yeah. up against Eve Gamal, that, that's, a, that's a classic shot. And I do think that it's exciting that this, you know, franchise now is getting, uh, getting a continuation. Um, I played a good amount of the original. I never finished it. At the time, I had never experienced uh, one of those style of games. Um, but now that I am more experienced, uh, I do want to check this one out. One thing that, um, for me, this trailer didn't do too much. It was like, yeah, they're in space. Yeah, it's, just, it's a rabbit tumor. It, it or whatever. did a lot for me. But the, I just want to say it did a lot for me because at the fun. time, it was still not at all obvious whether Nintendo was going to be making any Metroid announcements. And so some shots in it, <laughs> like this one that we're looking at right yeah, now, where they're yeah. sending down into the atmosphere, were very exciting. It's like, all right, well, if we don't get a Metroid game at this E3, at least we'll have this. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, but and then we didn't me, get a Metroid uh, game. Yeah, and then we did. Yes, and we'll certainly get into that. Oh, yeah. But uh, for, for me, it was seeing the... or I had to sort of scrounge for the gameplay afterward, and I found it, and, and I'm surprised at how much of a, of a leap forward it looks. I mean, free movement and, and upgraded you know combos and stuff like that looks like it'll make the game more action-packed and, and fast-paced, and that's very exciting. Yeah. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So... Uh, after the Ubisoft presentation, uh, we had the Devolver Digital 2021 presentation. Uh, only a very, very small handful of video games were actually shown off at this presentation. I would say about like 70, 75 percent of uh, this particular showcase was just Devolver Digital doing weird skits involving chili dogs and all sorts of weird unspeakable things uh but this was a good time this was a good ass time the, the, you know devolver digital has honed its craft over the course of the past several e3s doing weird ass bizarro uh, presentations like this one and i think that this is definitely one of their best if not their best they showed off phantom abyss here and that thing looks rad i forgot to mention that is in the that doc. the game where you play as a crow no, um, it's like a temple kind of runner. 
Oh, yeah. Uh, the the randomly generated. And you see like other people's player. shadows as they're going through and where they've yeah. died. Um, but it's kind of cool that only one person can beat the temple, and once one person beats that temple, it's done. Yeah, I do think that this oh. game will be a fun thing to see, and honestly, probably not for too long. But when it comes out, I think people will be, excuse me, hopping into it and and seeing how this sort of multiplayer ends up working. You know, hopefully it does. Um, but it does. It's a it's a great concept. And I'm interested to see uh, when is the game coming out. Does anyone know off the top of my head? No, uh, no. Yeah, that's fine. But um, presumably but yeah. relatively soon. Looks cool. Um, kind of cool concept. I thought when they first shares the teaser about this that it was a pitfall game. That would have been uh, interesting. Pitfall. So, are you familiar with Pitfall, Cozy? I, I I watched the Angry Video Game Nerd video on Super Pitfall, the NES game, and, and yes, I know it goes I know all the way back the, to Atari. Yeah, I know of the Atari games and how they were like like the the first notable platforming series before yeah. Mario. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So anyway, so this looks like it could be kind of cool. Kind of um, what was that ninja game? Uh, Cyber Ninja game, not Cyber. Cyber Park. Shadow. Cyber. Sh- nope. No, no, no. Uh, runner. What are you talking about? Shadow Runner. Shadow Runner. Does that sound right? Bit Trip Runner? My friend played it. No, um, no, no. Were... I know exactly no. what he's talking about. My friend has um, gameplay of it up on our channel. It's recent. I didn't play it myself. Came out at the end of last year. Sort of uh, futuristic, such... wall runny. Yeah. The, are, are the guys... problem with those kind of games. Are you referring to the one where like you have like therapy segments? Ghost Runner. Between... Ghost Runner. Oh, Ghost yeah. Runner. Now you're thinking of Katana Zero? I, yeah. I was thinking of Katana Zero, but clearly I was yeah. not thinking of the game that you guys were thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. No, Ghost Runner. Um, anyway, so it, it kind of has that first person, like, got to get around and, uh, like, maneuver parkour wise, um, which a lot of people like. So, and I think the fact that only one person can win everyone is kind of cool. Anyway, sorry. We don't have to talk too much more about that. We got some bigger fish. Nor do we need to talk too much about the presentation that happened after the Devolver digital presentation, which was the uh, Gearbox uh, E3 presentation. Uh, Posey, yeah. Why wasn't there gameplay for Tina Tiny Tina's Wonderlands? Because fascinating. uh, uh, What's his face? Uh, Magician Man insisted on walking around the set of the Borderlands movie for fifty minutes. Calling everybody muggles while while he does it. I think that movie might actually be good, but that entire so. thing was cringe. Yeah, it, it was it was pretty sus, as the kids these days God tend to damn. say. Yeah, uh, they do say that. But good news! Uh, after the Gearbox presentation, we finally got our first drop of water in the desert that has been this E3 thus far. You know, ignoring pockets yes. of hope like the uh, Jeff Keighley presentation. Uh, it was the Xbox and Bethesda game showcase uh, where we got Hell to yeah. see many a beloved Xbox game, uh, including this little game called. Hold on, Hello. Hold on, let me. I want to see if I'm Hello? pronouncing this correctly. Hello. He- he- hello, Halil. I think it's ah, hello. hello. I, I'm pretty sure it's hello. Is it like an acronym? Is it like H, like four words that begin with H A L O? I think the H is silent. It's Allo. Oh, it's Allo. Hate infinite. <laughs> yeah. Hate yeah, also we, laughing only. We got to see uh, Halo. Great infinite, acronym. Which, AJ, yes. I know that you are very, very excited about. Well, he was Absolutely. quiet and had an erection during the entire time. Oh, uh, I was throbbing. Um, Again, a family friendly show dirty. here at Press YYZ. Yeah, very friendly about my throbbing wrecked member. Um, my Spartan? No. Um, okay, so <laughs> Energy Sword, that's the one. Um, no, so the, the trailer started off with some, um, with, with a, a good. Uh, talk with bonnie ross and joseph staten um i always pronounced it staten because of staten island but um Mm. campaign wise you know we saw some uh some intriguing stuff um apparently cortana has been deleted and there's this new very reminiscent of cortana ai there with the master chief um and that has some interesting implications because she was supposed to uh, self-delete herself when 
at, as soon as Cortana was deleted, but they're getting confirmation that Cortana was deleted and she's not self-deleting herself and she doesn't know why. So is Cortana still alive? Who can say? That, Spoilers for Halo probably, 5, by the way. I just want to say that new AI that they showed off, that it kind of reminded me of like how they gave Pikachu a subtle redesign over the years to make him skinnier. Yeah. Like this is this new yeah. AI is like the skinny Pikachu to the fat she, Pikachu she's that got, was Cortana. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, d d she's got clothes instead of just naked AI data body. Showing her data bits all over the place, you know, jiggling them around. No. Um Cortana Cortana as a character, I've always loved. She's always been great. Um and I'm kind of excited to see um who this new ai is and turns out to be like if you played halo 5 there you know it could be there there was a moment where bits of cortana i'm gonna i'm gonna spoil it here i know you'll get to it eventually kind of ended up like um gladys in portal 2 where you took the the bits and pieces apart and like mm. uh, of all the different personality cores Yep. Something kind of like that happened. So I assume she's derived from one of those or she's a completely new and original uh, AI unit based off of Dr. Catherine Halsey, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I wish I wish Alex Ballant was here tonight to gush about it. Maybe he will be back uh, another time and we can talk about it then. But yeah, um, yeah then they did some multiplayer stuff. Uh, about this and this this got me so absolutely hyped um and it wasn't just this initial presentation at this conference it was uh the stuff that even came after it right um they did a nice good quick six minute presentation a little bit of a campaign and then a bunch of multiplayer stuff um afterwards and then on was it monday they showed uh released a 12 minute multiplayer kind of gameplay trailer with the devs talking interspersed throughout kind of like how uh, a previous uh, was it Ubisoft should be doing their some of yeah. their their talks and stuff um it, the, Microsoft has nailed it when it comes to Halo on how how to present it and pitch it their execution on Halo has never as hasn't always been stellar in in more more recent especially with th in the 343 era but this looks absolutely promising um really quick i'm just going to go and read verbatim this reddit thread that i found uh just summarizing everything in this multiplayer um that uh the general info from from this 12 minute thing everything new in multiplayer Overshield and ac active camo are still in the game. Players can now pick them up and choose to activate it when they want. If you die with it before using it, someone can pick it up off your body. Vehicles are delivered by pelicans in Big Team Battle. Weapon respawns via UNSC drop pods in Big Team Battle. Customization is off the charts. Players can customize more than ever before, including prosthetics and return and the return of armor effects. Um, battle passes for seasons will never expire. Like the Master Chief Collection, players can choose to go back and purchase previous battle passes even after a season has ended, which is actually something that no other companies... It's like they gotten, they've gotten rid of the, the, the FOMO when it comes to mm. battle passes, right? Very interesting. Um, yeah, it's it's a very good consumer friendly take on that. Um, cross progression and cross play between PC and Xbox consoles. Um, Academy mode allows players to enter a space where they can practice movement and get basic tutorials. It's it's a new fancy tutorial you can practice bots and stuff against bots and stuff. Scoping with weapons like the assault rifle and needler return, similar to the smart scope in Halo Five. Um, there's no loot boxes. Uh, majority of customization will be unlocked simply by playing the game. Customization uh, items are only unlocked by one source. Example: uh, An example was uh, given. If somebody unlocks something from a battle pass, it won't be possible to purchase that individual item. That's also very consumer friendly. It will always be tied to that battle pass. Um, vehicles feature more expansive damage states. 
Uh, it's possible to blow tires off and stuff like that, like and and it'll handle differently, um, which is a in very interesting change. Um, uh, one, once a vehicle has been damaged enough, it'll enter a doom state. Think, you know, GTA, once it catches fire, get the fuck out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, the new UNSC Razorback vehicle can store equipment. So you could pick up the rocket launcher, store it in, in the trunk of this car, and then drive drive the car to the other side of the battlefield. And then, surprise, there's you got a fucking ro rocket launcher there that nobody knew. Um Bots will be available in custom games. Um, the traditional red versus blue forced armor color in team games is gone. So normally it was, you know, if you're on the red team, your armor would just default color red. If you're on the blue team, your armor would default color blue. It was very easy to kind of see the contrast difference between uh, the two teams that way. But it did kind of limit your customization of your, like, why am I customizing my armor set? Uh, if the majority of what I play is team, uh, you know, a team-based mode, nobody's going to be able to see it because it's just going to coat everything in red or blue. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right? And so players will instead have customizable colored uh, outlines around them to signify their team. So most likely a red outline or a blue or a blue outline or something like that or a friendly and uh, like we've seen in other other games and stuff. Um, and sprint, slide, and clamber are all present um, and, and confirmed to be in there as well. So Alex will be slightly unhappy, but based on his reaction on Twitter, he seems super excited about it. Nathan's bored, I can tell. Well, <laughs> sorry, Nathan. Uh, while we were watching I can't the presentation, wait hello. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. And while we were watching the presentation, though, I mean, I'd certainly say that none of us were bored because on the whole, the presentation was quite great. Obviously, aside from Absolutely. Halo, we got to see uh, a lot of other great first and third party games uh, coming to the platform. Some maybe not enough like uh, the new Bethesda uh, developed Starfield, for example, which looks yeah, promising yeah. and sounds promising, but, you know, kind of a small trailer I on that side i don't know enough about it i was hoping to see gameplay this time like they gave a release date for next year uh november 11th um 2022 but i was still hoping that we'd see gameplay from it this like even like give us a small snippet they're obviously like if it's coming next year they gotta have something to show hmm. yeah uh, I, I was so. disappointed by that trailer i mean it funny funnily enough that leaked like what 10 minutes before the showcase which is hilarious it did but um yeah, yeah, it did. It, the it the did. trailer just dropped online, and people knew the uh, release date of the game before the showcase had even started. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it wasn't it, very far in advance, but it's not like like the Elden Ring leak wasn't nearly because Elden Ring Elden Ring leaked kind of that it was going to be at Jeff Keighley's thing because they updated a video that was set to private on their yeah. page like minutes before his conference started. Mm. But I mean, there were quite a few leaks through that this uh, this E3. We of course also got Martin Rabbit Sparks of Hope, uh, the the official web page going up the morning right. before the conference. Just yeah. some Nintendo employee accidentally hit go, and everything was out there. That was, that was pretty funny. But for Starfield, I am a fan of of uh, the Bethesda open world games, and I think Starfield is a is a going to be really cool. But the fact is that they we went from just seeing a logo to seeing space stuff and a logo, and then of course the release date, which is good. But the fact that they didn't show gameplay is is not necessarily worrisome, but just underwhelming. Because if you are starting off your show with this. I feel like it needed to have been more substantive. I really want to see the the scope of the game, what the, the in combat more more gun focused. Or, I don't know. So I, I just so, wish I'd seen more. Yeah, the, there was a logo in that trailer um, that what may be a little telling, and maybe you know, obviously they're clearly not ready to show too much of it yet. But um, Creation Engine Two, so they, it's not going to be the same Creation Engine that we've seen times past like this upgrade is probably going to be substantial to the to the effect of you know just a little bit that we saw like look at that sandwich in there yeah that sandwich um, looks great. I, sandwich. That, that's like going from unreal 3 immediately into unreal 5 like the the fidelity is so different compared to 
uh, previous games in this engine. So also, but I do worry about new engine, new problems potentially with Bethesda we'll games. Yeah, hopefully it works out. Also, I think and like as they are developing it for Xbox, which was announced as exclusive this time, because um, they they Phil has been dancing around that being an exclusive for a long time, not outright saying it. So and he made he, he made Todd Howard come out and do it. Yeah. Or, so, um, or let the video do it. It did say exclusive yeah. to Xbox um, yeah. in there. Uh, so they they finally had that out of the way. But because it's exclusive, like we've seen with many PlayStation um, um, games, they can use the like figure out the hardware to the benefit of them. Mm. Yeah, one hundred percent. Nevertheless, you know, people are not super, you know, happy about this. All the same, uh, you know, it's not a surprising announcement, but people still a little bit, you know, worse for wear. Which actually uh, was something that Pete Hines was confronted about uh, in an interview with Tamur Hussein, and he actually issued a little. Just, apology, I don't know how to, if you can believe, allay it. the fears and concerns of PlayStation Five fans, other than to say. Well, I'm a PlayStation 5 <laughs> player as well, and I've played games on that console, and there's games I'm going to continue to to play on it. Um, but, you know, if you want to play Starfield, PC and Xbox, sorry. I, yeah. Uh, all I can really say is, is I apologize. Um, because I, I don't I'm, think I'm he's really apologizing folks, but... for that. It feels like he's just trying to show some empathy for the PlayStation people. Yeah, yeah which is... You know, it, Bethesda's been given this really big opportunity because it can positively affect, you know, game development in general when you when you only need to focus on one platform, right? Yeah. There's a reason the 360 was the lead hardware um, in that generation for every multi-platform game. It's because it was easier to develop for. They were able to make it for that and then they had to port it over to ps3 in the cell processor and that was apparently a nightmare in yeah. itself right so mm -hmm. you know there there's benefits to lead hardware and only having to focus on one one aspect of it yeah and i think this is one of those situations correct me if i'm wrong starfield had when they announced starfield there was no consoles attached to it because they probably assumed it was no. next gen and yeah. didn't want to name the consoles that it was coming out for because they couldn't say what they were for. Um, so this is one of those situations where I think PlayStation gamers assumed they were getting it for a long time until that buyout. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. um, like there was no reason not to think until Bethesda bought Microsoft, where I've seen people complain about what? Sony's exclusive exclusivity on PlayStation. But the thing about that is that they're open about that. Like... Spider-Man was exclusive and it was announced right away as an exclusive. There was never a point well, where Xbox fans, they thought they were going to get it. Well, yeah. And it's, and so that that's just a complication of the buyout though. Right. Because, yeah. you know, it, it, in the past, this was an independent company who would, you know, Do, put their games multi-platform. Yeah. Right? No, hundred percent so, everywhere. And yeah. so, when you when you even when you think of something like Sunset Overdrive, right? Yep. Um, that game came out from an independent studio who uh, put it out on Xbox, and Xbox paid for that game. Um, but then they got also acquired by Sony, and so if you played the original Sunset Overdrive, um, whatever may be happening next in that world, if at all, because the the studio retained the rights to the IP the sequel to that is only going to be on PlayStation now, which is, is the similar kind of bummer. It's just not on the same scale yep. as an entire catalog of games. Believe it or not, spoilers, but there's a sunset overdrive uh, Easter egg in Ratchet. I've heard, yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. That's, and that's, so, that's interesting. So at least one, I haven't gotten into many Easter eggs yet. And I figure, feel like most of them will be late game stuff. Once I unlock the Rhino. Hmm. Mm. So, no idea what that means to someone who hasn't played that game. <laughs> every, so every you're ratchet talking and Clank, out of your ass. There could be a there could be every a ratchet and clank has a rhino in it. Um, it it's R Y N O and it stands for rip you a new one, and it's okay. the ultimate gun in uh, the game. Gotcha, That's like gotcha. super overpowered. It's the, 
Yeah. Sure. Gotcha. Gotcha. So yeah, it, it, it's a crazy, and this one looks to be crazy because um, the only thing that I've been spoiled on is that it summons the thunder jaw from Horizon. Mm. Huh. That's so, very interesting. Um, cause they tweeted something out about it, uh, or somebody tweeted something about it. So I was like, okay, well let's uh, check this out anyway. So sorry. Don't mean to off track about it. Not a problem. Not a problem. So, you know, obviously there were a lot of really significant, uh, announcements and things to chew on to come out of the Xbox and Bethesda presentation. Uh, I want to take a little bit of time to talk about, uh, Horizon, uh, sorry, Forza Horizon 5. I got confused because you talked a little bit about Horizon Zero Dawn a second ago and the two got intertwined in my brain. Um, that Forza happens. Horizon 5. Uh, talk to me about this one. Do you want to start, I'll AJ? Start, I'll no, start as someone who yeah, doesn't play racing games. I've never played a Forza game. I've played Mario Kart. I don't know. I played a little bit of... Uh, a little bit of F-Zero, played a little bit of Wave Race. I've never played any game like this, but this game looks so good visually and in terms of it being free on Game Pass. I want to give this a try, and that's exciting for me to be introduced to a essentially an entirely new gameplay format from a, from a game that does look so fantastic that I want to give this a try. It does Can seem give- a little bit weird that cars are just going everywhere and I can't tell what's happening, but it's exciting because of that. So, okay, so number one, you should download and play Forza Horizon 4. It's available on Game Pass right now. Um, When Forza happens in the game, it takes place during the Forza Horizon Festival, and that's the city that's hosting it, which is kind of why, like, the excuse for all the cars and races and everything all over the place because they're doing the special festival. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, uh, this one, the scenery looks amazing. Uh, it's in Mexico, which was the rumored spot. And that was true. Um, everything looks so gorgeous with it. The last one they did was in, uh, um, England. So yeah, in England not, somewhere. not quite as scenic, um, except they did let you change the seasons. So, or the seasons would ch- will change weekly on you when you play it. Yeah. And um, it looks, it looks like in, in this, um, you're you, you're not necessarily going to get seasons where like suddenly the the Mexican desert is covered in snow, but you can climb a As mountain. You said that there's a there's a thing covered in snow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, this part it, was perfectly. Confusing. I timed it perfectly. Thanks for following the script. Um, no, it. You know, they're they're doing things like that, and like that that was the top of a volcano crater, right? Yeah. So there's going to be some interesting stuff that they're planning on doing. Uh, with that for sure um and there's like, like they're going with weather the big dust clouds and storms yeah. and stuff like that could be that could well, really be replaced seasons in terms of changing up the visuals yeah like they're pulling the, the battle cloud is fog yeah exactly yeah <laughs> yeah um, um so we, this should be really good and i think we should look at doing some game nights once it comes out i think that could be a lot of fun and as I said on the stream, I'm not going to, this isn't a game I'm super excited before, super excited for, uh, but if you need like a third wingman or driver or whatever they call your wingman or drivers in the Forza Horizon series, maybe, the, do they call them Fortsies? Let's we can start that. calling it that. Fortsies. Yeah. 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 If you, need you can a, be if a Fortsie. If you need a third Fortsie, I'm uh, there for you. Um, AJ, I know Much that like you... like the Monsties. Monsties. In... Uh, in... Yeah, we're a few, too. 20 press conferences uh, away from that one. Uh, I know, AJ, you also wanted to talk a little bit about the upcoming update to Sea of Thieves that's going to add yeah. a certain uh, uh, Hollywood pirate. Yeah, speaking so speaking of games that we should probably like play together at some point, get a good chunk of us together, um, Sea of Thieves is kind of one of those. I, I think we could, like, if we got four of us together, we could have a great time um the (laughs) what they announced is a a collaboration with disney and uh, they are bringing captain jack sparrow into uh sea of thieves uh, with some actual story-based adventure like content which um sea of thieves the base game i haven't played it you know recently but I, i played the shit out of it at the beginning uh because it was one of the very first uh, early uh, Game Pass games to like come out at the launch of the game for like on Game Pass, and I just had access to it, and you know I played the shit out of it. Um, but yeah, it, it, it 
the 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 gameplay of that was really at that point was was kind of lacking in that you had to go go to these islands you'd pick up these generic uh quest maps and you'd go to the island that it led you to and maybe dig some treasure up or maybe do a raid on this one area but uh, there was always a threat of other boats coming by and uh, they were filled with other players um and that was super super exciting like that part of it being able to steal treasure from other boats was super fascinating um and so seeing them go this direction like i can't really think of a better franchise to fit into the sea of thieves like regardless of your opinion of johnny depp um, peter pan peter well yeah maybe peter pan but I, i don't know if that is really in theme so much like maybe Maybe you could see Captain Hook, but Peter Pan himself, I don't know. Um, but it, it it looks good, and it looks like it might be fun enough to get me back into CFBs for a bit. Hell yeah. Uh, finally, before we move on to just talking about the next presentation, uh, Tucker, I want you to take an opportunity here to sell us on 12 Minutes which was also shown off at the Xbox showcase and has a very short trailer that I'm going to show off for about 30 seconds. As someone who doesn't know a ton about this game, I think for me, it's the selling point is that it is just so ridiculously unique. I mean, high caliber actors, uh, interesting concept, top down perspective on this, on this, you know, realistic game is is an interesting idea in itself and i'm just someone who's really into narrative focused games that do something with the element of interactivity that video games introduce i i honestly i'm a fan of walking sims i I don't know if any of you are but gone home firewatch those games are, are some of my favorites and this uh being something new for narrative format and and just so so different in terms of the scope of games that are shown at the xbox conference i'm very glad that this is being portrayed up there with the forges and your halos and stuff um as as a game at the showcase and i'm super excited to try it when it comes out uh it's been in development for god such a long time but um it's really exciting just to see something so unique be given the the limelight that i think it deserves because it looks really polished and really high quality cool 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 uh after uh the xbox and bethesda game showcase uh presentation uh we went ahead and watched the square enix uh presents together and it was an interesting experience because i think that we all like came out of it like fairly positive and then live on stream we actually looked up other people's reactions online and it was pretty quickly apparent that like ooh, a lot of the internet does not share our feelings of general positivity people were really pissed off uh at this presentation and i certainly don't think it is the worst presentation to come out of this e3 but i definitely understand why it was the most disappointing so i think i understand why people are upset and why we weren't as phased we didn't care about the final fantasy stranger of paradise final fantasy origin game Mm -hmm. like where i think people were really looking forward to that so when it didn't look great it didn't phase us sure because it was probably something we weren't going to play yeah um i don't know i can't speak for all of us but that's how i felt um same with the what was the other game that they showed um the uh babylon's fall babylon's fall Uh, once again i don't think that game was speaking to us either before this so it didn't feel like a disappointment because we weren't really looking forward to it where i think some of these especially as you get into the gaming community there's souls fans who were being like oh this sounds awesome and like i heard multiple podcasts talking about how cool that sounded um and we're looking Mm -hmm. forward to it um and babylon's fall i like blessing specifically from kind of funny has said multiple times how much how forward he's looking to babylon's fall so I get why there's disappointment. I had my own issues with it. Um, I don't think it was well paced. I think Guardians of the Galaxy went for like it was good, but I think it went for way too long. It was half the oh, presentation. God. So yeah. l- l- let's like, talk a little bit about that. Uh, totally in agreement. Guardians of the Galaxy uh, definitely went on for a little bit too long, and you know, indicative eh. of the fact that Square Enix probably should you know have figured out how to consolidate its content a little bit better. But the game looks pretty good. Yeah, no, agree. Yeah. It looks I, like a good Mar- a good Avengers game. 
Yeah, it, it, it super does. I, I don't think it was too long. I, if anything, like based on everything that happened in the rest of that conference, I kind of wish we got more of it, Hmm. but that's just me. Um, I'm not a final fantasy person. Um, and I'm not really a JRPG person. Um, they could have done. They could have done what Halo did, and like, you know, here here's a six minute thing with with some you know story trailer and then some gameplay, um, and then you know release the the rest of it later on. But um, I I I was super interested in, in that, and I want to see more. Um, it looks like the the characters are based more on the the comic book designs, which is great. Um, I don't know why. Uh, Rocket Raccoon has that weird friggin' beard goatee thing, yeah, but that's, fine. that's that's the 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 probably the least appealing part. Um, is his goatee for me, anyway? Is his goatee like <laughs> that's a that's a very specific complaint. It's uh, yeah, like it's distracting. It's very distracting. For me, this I, game is interesting for a couple of reasons. I do think that it's cool that they're clearly combining the MCU Guardians aesthetic with the exact same team, which is a little bit disappointing. The Guardians is such a diverse comic team with an interesting roster that I wish they'd at least included one other one, but you know, that's a minor complaint. With the yep. comic uh, designs, and they said they're pulling in more obscure characters, which is exciting. I think this game looks great. It's It's really cool that they're that they're continuing these marvel properties um but i i honestly do think that it went on too long to the point of we were getting repeated gameplay segments yeah. like we were seeing things in the trailer in the extended gameplay cut and while i think this is kind of the ideal way to review to reveal a game trailer dev interview gameplay footage like all of those you you get everything you know exactly what you want got a release date and everything but when you're doing gameplay that goes on for so long that you're seeing repeats yeah. and have, feel the need to the cut in so order bad. in order to get to pe- what people want to see, that's not a good sign. And and I think that if they had truncated it a little bit, it would have kept the pacing a little more. And and while everything I saw of the game was great, you know, they they should have just held back a little bit. Yeah. But I I'm looking forward to playing this game. This is one of the few games from the C3 that I'm probably most definitely going to pick up at release. Uh, I do hope that some of the narrative choices that you get to make in the game do actually have like a substantial impact on the rest of the game's narrative and even possibly level design. Um, You know, prior to working on this game, uh, IDOS Montreal worked on Deus Ex Mankind Divided, where the uh, choices that you made in that game really did have a substantial impact on the rest of the uh, experience before you. And so here's hoping they can bring a little bit of that to this game. Um, I also uh, want to cede the floor to you, Nathan and Tucker for just a second to talk a little bit about the Final Fantasy pixel remakes, uh, which we kind of glossed over in talking about the biggest announcements uh, of this particular presentation, but uh, which did cause a bit of a stir when it got uh, shown off on account of the way in which Square Enix is going to be re-releasing these remakes. Yeah, man. I'm so so disappointed. Talk about a way of taking the wind out of the sails of an announcement. I have recently become a Final Fantasy fan. I played six at the end of last year, and that was my first Final Fantasy experience. I loved it. Oh, like really? I, sincerely, that game what? is amazing. Uh, so, like, I'm curious. Like, you know, uh, I'm somebody who you know got into Final Fantasy via some of the modern Final Fantasies, like Final sure. Fantasy 13 and Final Fantasy 7 remake, for example. And I know that to be oh, true. The bad a lot ones. Of, you, you, you need to keep playing more of Final Fantasy 7 remake. You, you'll come around. All right. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, and I know that to be true of a lot of other people in my age range. I- I'm curious, what inspired you to specifically go to six first? Uh, Easy Allies, Hall of Greats. Uh, there is a fantastic Final Fantasy VI um, video, which I can link for you guys, that just entirely sold me on the game. Um, and-, and I just pulled out my SNES Classic, started it, and I, I really fell in love with it. And I- I'm not someone who plays a lot of... And previously had played a lot of traditional JRPGs, but th- this game is, it, it really is as good as people make it out to, to sound. And I'm 20 years old, right? This isn't my demographic. This came out, I was not even, the idea of me wasn't even conceived. Um, but I 
thought it was absolutely fantastic and I played it hours and hours on end and I was so excited by the idea that not only could I play this game, one of my new favorite games of all time in uh, in a new re-release on my favorite console of all time, Nintendo Switch, was and these other games, so exciting. Then you get to the end of the trailer, which didn't show gameplay, so we have no idea what the games look like, and then it says Steam and Mobile, which is such a way to knock the wind out of sales because those games are already re-released on those platforms in these terrible, disgusting uh, re- remakes. It's just people, the worst possible way you could have announced that. I was looking on Twitter. People have extracted what appears to be like sprites yeah. from the remakes and they look like they look solid they look way better than the yeah uh, kind of crappy looking uh phone releases that we've seen so mm-hmm. that's that's a, a silver lining i guess yeah it is but not having it not on consoles the, the places where these games need to be accessible is an enigma like the nintendo switch can run final fantasy 3 right this is not a crazy idea to put it on these consoles and i don't exactly i i have no idea why they wouldn't so, I'm just I'm so frustrated by it. I get their decision, I don't get their decision. Cause you talked about like accessibility and platforms. The honest truth is mobile's the most accessible way to play any game ever. Yeah. Um and there's nothing these are turn based RPGs. So there's like if they have decent touch controls, there's no reason they shouldn't work on mo- mobile really well in theory. And I'm not I would rather see them on console personally. Yeah. <sighs> I do yeah. understand why it's there and why they're going that direction because they're turn-based opera RPGs and they'll work on mobile and they're going to make money on mobile selling them because apparently they're all going to be individual and they're not going to be, um, they're all going to be individual and they're not going to be a collection, which is ridiculous. Yeah. Do, do you guys remember years, years ago, people were begging and begging for, a remake of Final Fantasy VII, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. And then one year at E3, it seemed like Square Enix heard heard their cries, and they said they came out on stage and said Final Fantasy VII, and they didn't do anything to it. They just released it on consoles, as is. They oh, I thought it. yeah, I thought you were talking yeah. about the tease where they showed what Final Fantasy VII would look like on a PS3 years ago there well that that didn't help that's things what inspired right? the, the that's what inspired it and then yeah everybody kept oh you need to do this you need to do this and then all they did is bring final fantasy 7 as like original out on the the current consoles at the time mm-hmm. and it's just like no, that's not no pe- please invest in in a remake please and then they finally did and look what it's done for them in the yeah. last year right yeah, but so, when do I get my it, Final Fantasy IX remake? That's the important question. Give me a Final Fantasy VI remake, please. They they, they yeah. caught themselves in a trap with all of these with the with the how great uh, Seven Remake was. But I think even just having these games accessible on these platforms, it, it would would appease a lot of people. I mean, some of these games are some of the highest regarded JRPGs of all time, and they're not fit, demanding on the hardware. So it's just it. I, I would not be surprised. If we get an announcement of them coming to other to the consoles later on, but the fact that it didn't happen there, and I don't know if you guys have seen the one that there's a reaction to this that's been circulating mm-hmm. on Twitter recently. Where yeah, we, just, we watched. People are so excited, and then oh, we, we or, yeah. if you're referring to the Rocco reaction, we watched that Might reaction uh, at the end of our reactions to the Square Enix presentation, and it's yeah, it's it's sad. And that's about all yep. I have to say on it. Um, um, yeah. Uh, what was I going to say about it? Like, do you think Square after the show looks at their like looks at the feedback and go, "Wow, we really like m- messed up." Do you think that's in there? All we can hope. It's all we can hope. I don't know. I don't know. I, I feel like uh, on some level, like I, I have to imagine they're probably going to take people's uh, demands to see the Final Fantasy Pixel remakes on consoles seriously. But I also think that they, with regards to some of the other games that they showed off, like Babylon's Fall and Stranger Paradise, I feel like they they kind of showed off what it is that they felt right to show off. And I don't know how much we're going to see them take people's feedback of those games into consideration. Speaking of which... 
Uh, I actually went ahead and played the Stranger of Paradise Final Fantasy Origin demo uh, that was released hmm. on the PlayStation 5 recently. Unfortunately, you know, much to Square Enix's embarrassment, the uh, demo initially was unplayable on account of the software being all mucked up. But uh, yesterday it was finally made available to play for all. Uh, and would you know it, it's not bad at all. Um, it's not quite... Uh, as pure of a souls like as people wanted it to be which is one of the things that yeah. you know upset people when they saw the trailer for this in the presentation uh, but what it is is a fairly unique action game uh the one mechanic that i want to highlight uh about the experience that kind of stood out to me is that uh every enemy in the game has a soul meter underneath their health bar that depletes slightly faster than their health uh, but also will replenish over time um if you manage to deplete their soul meter you can perform a move that instantly kills them and also uh replenishes your magic meter and also increases how uh long your magic meter currently is which allows you to do more and more magic moves basically the longer you stay alive um that and a couple of other systems in the game really impressed me it's a from what I played of it, I think going to be a quality experience when it comes out. The only thing, though, is I don't know whether that quality will carry over to its story, which I did not yeah. see much of when I played the demo. Uh, there there really was not much story-wise beyond what was in the reveal trailer. Guy wants to kill chaos, 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 chaos. Um, and, and it's the kind of thing where, like, you know, Final Fantasy VII Remake showed uh, to me that you can like both have a really great Final Fantasy battle system and also at the same time tell a really competent, well done story. And so I feel like the the, the bar has been raised with regards to me, uh, you know, wanting these high quality narrative experiences in my JRPGs. Yeah. I, I feel like I, my, my tolerance for, you know, uh, crappy stories has definitely been uh lowered by quite a bit so i feel like th the jury's out on whether or not i get this game when it uh finally releases i want to see just what in the world is going on with this chaotic story mm -hmm. Oh, uh, after the Square Enix presentation, uh, we had the PC gaming showcase. And then after that, the feature game show, um, both of them very similar, lots of indie games, lots of double A, triple A ish games that we've seen before. Not a lot came out of either that I was particularly excited for. And I get the sense that nobody here had much thoughts on them either. I didn't watch them, so I don't know what was in them. Was there anything of note? That's my question. I didn't. I don't know anything about either of these showcases. Like I said, a lot of like a mix of like new games, but also like you know, again, double dips uh, that we had seen previously. Sure. Some of the other yeah. things, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, after that, though, we had a relatively short uh, indie game showcase uh, where mm -hmm. uh, one of the announcements was that Airborne Kingdom uh, is going to be I know that game. to console. Yes, we do know that game uh, because yeah. many a fortnight ago, uh, we had um, AJ's friend on to talk about this game. Yeah, my uh, my friend uh, Ben was on the podcast. I think it was episode 26. Um that feels like a lifetime ago. Um, and uh, he, uh, we, we ended up talking about uh, this game that he and his uh, co-workers were making called Airborne Kingdom. Um, and uh, they announced the C3 that it uh, is coming to console finally. Um, so wow. if you like city builders, um, this one's got a nice unique twist where you build a city in the sky and you have to uh essentially control your the city in the sky by you know making sure it's well balanced and everything and, and navigate the world below gathering resources to try and uh keep your your city afloat um i'm gonna be honest cool. i'm looking at a gameplay right now this this sounds fantastic i've never it, heard of this before obviously you guys have a connection to it but yeah i'm i'm really into this so thank you for like your eyes to it you're very welcome Somebody clip that, please. <laughs> I can send it to him. Hey, Dev, thank you for making us such a cool game. Yeah. I don't know your name. I, I apologize, but it looks really cool. It's Ben. Ben, thank you. 
after that, we had the uh, Capcom game showcase, which was a lot of Phoenix Wright footage and the announcement that we're getting uh, DLC for Resident Evil 8 and not a whole lot else. Uh, and then finally... Uh, to round out uh, this E3, aside from the uh, Bandai Namco presentation, where we got more of House of Ashes, the dark picture uh, anthology game, uh, we got the Nintendo Direct, uh, which, uh, let me tell you, going into that Nintendo Direct, a lot of people were attributing savior status to it. They were saying, you know, save us, Nintendo, please, you know, uh, save this E3 from damnation. And I wrote on Twitter ahead of time, like, man, I really think that people are you know setting themselves up for disappointment attributing savior status to nintendo in this instance let's just go into it with tempered expectations and you know what this isn't necessarily the greatest nintendo direct of all time but it was damn good and uh pretty much everyone in, in this particular instance seems to agree yeah i uh i'm on i was on that side of me and my friend made exactly that video of nintendo has to save e3 Right, we were talking about the fact that it has been so lackluster, but Nintendo obviously does their own thing. And for the two of us, I thought this was an absolutely fantastic direct. Through and through, I was I was surprised and excited by almost every announcement. I got a ton of things that filled out the rest of their lineup for 2021, and it really turned around the year for me for Nintendo. And I'm excited to have such a constant release of new and exciting content coming out on my Nintendo Switch. It like for me, it was fine. Um... I don't think this is a great Nintendo Direct. Um, I would give it a B minus uh, mm -hmm. if we're grading E three presentations. I think uh, like to compare Xbox was like an A plus for me mm -hmm. um, with what was presented and the games that were there. And I think mm -hmm. um, the Nintendo one number one too much double dipping. There were too many things that had appeared at other presentations. With yeah. them going last, yeah. they needed they should have really asked questions about where else are you showing this. Great point. Um, so, because there was way too much double dipping, um, we started with Guardians of the Galaxy, which we already saw too much of, as well, I've stated in the Ubisoft Technically, conference. before even Guardians Gosh. of the Galaxy, we had uh, our reveal of Kazuya Mishima coming to oh, Super Smash great. Bros. Ultimate. Uh, not a problem. Uh, um, yeah, it, it's, a, a, it's an inoffensive announcement. It, it's Bandai Namco literally made Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. They deserved another rep. And honestly, as someone who I'm not a Tekken fan, I haven't played Tekken in my life, um, his combos look crazy. So I can't wait for the Sakurai moveset breakdown. Uh, uh, this is not a character that I have much of an affinity for, but you know what? Uh, so people remember back in the day that you know different versions of soul Calibur 2 had different guest characters the one in gamecube had link uh the one in yep. playstation uh, as it was explained to me live had kazuya uh and no I, I mixed that up oh so number one i want to apologize because i as a fake tekken fan because i'm obviously a fake fan i mixed up names oh, number no. one i said it was Jin and Jin's kazuya's son and hayachi's kazuya's father yes Okay. Um, and Hayachi was who was in Tekken, and that I did say, but I kept calling him Jin during the trailer because I'm Heihachi obviously is of a course fan. in Tekken. Wait, I'm very confused here. I'm not exactly familiar with these games, but he's he's not a guest character. No, he's he was a guest caliber, a guest character. Oh, guest Soul, Soul Caliber. My bad. For the GameCube, right. Soul yeah, Caliber Two. Uh, uh, no, not for the GameCube. For Link the was or. For PlayStation. And All that was say, on PlayStation and Spawn was on Xbox. And yeah. that's what I was leading up to say. I feel like we need to complete the trilogy now and have Spawn come to Smash Bros. Uh, well, this is the uh, right Spawn character. Spawn was in so. uh, Mortal Kombat 11. The, the, the web yeah. continues. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah he, he was in Mortal yeah. Kombat 11. Yep. I, I, I was watching um, the Giant Bomb reaction to um, the, the Nintendo stream, and when they first saw... Um, what's his name carrying ganondorf mm -hmm. they their first take was oh shit are they bringing ganondorf to tekken and then they were immediately disappointed that it was smash brothers huh i think it would have been cool either way but yeah I don't know. um yeah i i think this is cool i think this kind of completes their fighting game bringing fighting game characters to it because they've got ken and ryu they've got terry from uh king of fighters and now they've got a character from tekken i don't know if that's the character i would have picked in fact if i had picked a character it probably would have been yoshimitsu um mm -hmm. appears in both tekken and uh soul caliber mm -hmm. 
as a playable character, and he could have covered two franchises. I personally would have chosen Yoda, who also appeared in Soul Calibur. That's <laughs> not... Uh, you can't pick that. No. What about Darth Vader? Allowed. Same reason. And no, you can't pick Star Killer either. Oh, damn. I was just about to bring him up. Uh, one video game character, however, from the stars that Nintendo can uh, pick to spotlight once again is Samus Aran, because we got the surprise announcement of Metroid Dread at this E3 not long after uh, the Kazuya Smash Bros. reveal. Uh, I was very happy uh, when this popped up live, uh, and I'm quite proud that I managed to get a lot of details right on this particular prediction, because I predicted that we would see a 2D uh, Metroid game at this e3 as much as i claimed ahead of time like oh man we're not going to see any metroid no metroid at all um mm. i posted on twitter shortly after the game was revealed you know i'm really happy that with this particular game they didn't go with a remake uh, a lot of people have been saying in the lead up to this e3 oh man i'd really love a remake of fusion and make no mistake fusion's a great game and you know i think it's it's great that people are nostalgic for fusion because for a really long time people were re really not nostalgic for fusion in the way that they are now um but i'm glad that they instead chose to make an entirely new game that it would seem is taking the kind of mechanics of fusion, uh, the kind of SAX sequences of that game where Samus is being pursued by a deadly enemy that can kill her immediately and basically taking it to a whole new level. And I'm happy that they're giving Mercury C more work because that developer yeah. did a good job with um, Samus returns and it seems like they're going to do an even better job here. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to be that guy and say that I really wish and I really hope that they the previous quadrilogy of this line of Metroid games, um, I hope that they kind of go back and and bring them into this engine or something, because that would be huh. super cool. I think I, mean, I think it would be super cool. That's a ton of work, but it'd be very that. interesting. Yeah, it would be like make it make it all as like either a, a collection or make it all as like one one whole game story, right? And it's like a mm. chapters in it or something. Mm. I don't know. And at the very least, GBA Online. Come on, Nintendo, yep. just let us play Fusion and Zero Mission on Nintendo Switch. Which um, and, and I'm gonna be playing those games soon. I'm I'm very excited for this game. I think the one thing I have to say to sort of counteract this. Um, this direct being disappointing in any way, and why I personally believe that it was fantastic, and in in my eyes, saved D three is that if you go through, especially the first part of Nintendo announcements here, if if you had seen that on a paper before the direct, it would have sounded fake, right? Mm -hmm. Everything shown off here is exactly what the fans wanted. They're they're well, they're a Metroid game direct two D sequel to Fusion that is called Dread. You've got. Uh, Mario Party that's a remake with a focus on online and fantastic visuals and button controls. You've got the return of WarioWare and the trailer for Breath of the Wild and return of Advance Wars, which we're going to get to. The reason I was so excited by this direct is because it felt like genuine fan-pleasing surprises that we haven't been getting from Nintendo for, for quite a while. And and I was, I'm so happy that all these games seem really exciting to me. The yeah, and like the name the name Metroid Dread has been kicking around for like fifteen years since Fusion, yeah. right? So mm -hmm. the fact that they even went with it after all this time, like that that's super of course yeah, that would have sounded fake, but Exactly. They made it work. It's my like literally the definition of like a fan servicing move. Like they could have called it anything 100%. else. And the fact that they called it uh, Metroid Dread, it shows that, you know, they wanted to, they want to show that they're listening. I'm still waiting for Legend of Zelda Valley of the Flood. Oh, my God. I remember. Is that, that Wind yeah. Waker? No, no. The, it, like it'd be this. It'd be the 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 events before wind waker which is it was uh, just like a fan image that somebody made they made up a it, logo for it and everything i remember it not being a fan image but like a fake interview that made its way oh, into don't, like the ign forums so I basically the interview i don't remember if this was like this must have been like 2009 because it was before skyward sword but after twilight princess somebody like posted a fake interview between shigeru miyamoto and some guy from like some uh, obscure unknown game site and basically shigeru miyamoto diving into hell oh yeah the next game's going to be a prequel to the wind waker where hyrule is going to gradually become flooded over time and it was like man this is 
totally 1 million percent fake, but it's kind of a cool idea. I just posted mm. the thing that I that I saw in the podcast chat, if you want to bring that up so you can see it. Yeah, I, I've seen this image before. I'm pretty certain that this was like inspired by that fake interview. Yeah, I mean, regardless, that's a great logo. Hell yeah. Like, imagine. Mm-hmm. Imagine. And it'll never yeah, happen. You had something to say about all this, though? So, here's... So, I wanted 2D Metroid. I don't know if I love the concept of being chased. I hate being chased in games. Uh, yeah. I really don't yeah. like the feeling of that. Um, so, I don't know. It, 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 We'll see if it's for me, but I have concern over price point. And that was a thought during this Nintendo direct for a few games. Um, because in this day and age, don't get me wrong. Metroid's a big deal, but Metroid needs to sell mm. to get another game. That's it's a, like a low selling franchise. That's why we don't see many installments from it. Yeah. Um, and it's a full price, $80 game. Canadian um 60 us no 70 us 80 canadian um uh, anyways yeah, whatever. US, yeah. yeah a lot of money. um yeah it's a lot of money meanwhile you have independent indie games which have been putting out banners of metroidvanias for like 20 or 30 dollars sure yeah that are it's a good point like bet like i don't want to say better like we don't know how this game's going to be but definitely have taken on the spiritual successors like i think about something like axiom verge which was metroid when nintendo wouldn't do any metroid and it was a love letter to it and it's a fantastic game um and you've got so much of this competition in the indie space right now at the same time we've got super mario party no nope, mario party superstars yep um which looks like it's based on the Super Mario Party engine and could have potentially been DLC for Super Mario Party that everybody well, kind of wanted. That that's salt right. on the wound for both of us because I bought Super yes, Mario Party just specifically just so that I could play it online when the online update rolled out. So I'm kind of salty on that one too. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, and it's not the only thing like Advanced Wars, I believe is, uh, which you can segue into yeah, quickly, sure. but um uh, um advance wars is uh on the um i can't even talk advance wars is full price as well and once again it's a remake of two games and i'm a sucker because i'm part of the problem i paid full price for link's awakening because it's my favorite zelda game um and it was really good but i worry that nintendo doesn't explore the price point they just kind of seem to drop $80 bombs all the time. Mm-hmm. And I would like to see them play with that price point a little more. The good thing is there's a couple of games that they're releasing that are at a lower price point. You got Metopia earlier this year, which, of course, is a remake. But um, WarioWare, Get It Together, which we're not really talking about, is also um, at the lower price point. I think it's like it's $10 less. So it's not a huge difference. But you are right. One thing I would say about Metroid is I think that this will likely be the, I, I'm future projecting the best selling Metroid game of all time. And that's not a high bar because the best selling one is the original at less than 2.5 million. So I think it can easily surpass that as you see games like even new series like Arms selling 2.5 million. Metroid, especially a 2D return to the series after so long, I think this will sell really well regardless of that full price point. And I think that also the fact that there isn't a bigger game overshadowing it this holiday season in terms of Nintendo games. Of course, you have Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl, but I think this will sell really well. And I don't think people are really going to be caring too much about that price point. Nintendo's mm-hmm. certainly doing a good job of promoting Metroid Dread on its social channels, which is definitely yep. always appreciated. Uh, I, I do want to take a quick second and talk a little bit about WarioWare Get It Together. Uh, it's really great to have uh, another WarioWare on the horizon because these games are always a ton of fun. I will say, I don't know how sold I am by the core conceit of this game, which is that you can play as any one of Wario's cadre of friends and they all function a little bit differently in each of the micro games. Uh, just based on the fact that, you know, the last Wario game that we got, um, the one on the Wii U where it's like a bunch of different game and Wario. Yeah. Game and Wario. Um, like one of the complaints with that game is that, Hey, you have some really quality experiences here, like the gamer mini game, which was eventually recreated in smash bros. But then you have a lot of others that are just kind of whatever. And like looking at the footage here, it's like, 
I have a feeling that, like, for example, the UFO character, he's probably going to be very popular, but I feel like uh, what's his face just checking rocks at the tree from down below, probably not going to be so popular. I got the feeling that, like, you're probably going to have a a, a tier list of characters that people really kind of gravitate to and characters that they basically all but ignore. Um, But it's still cool that this game's coming. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the fact that it is co-op micro games for the first time in the series, and the accessibility of the Switch being the easy co-op multiplayer, I mean, it's it's perfect for what we'd want for a return to WarioWare, but also taking advantage of the special capabilities of the hardware. Uh, I do want to ask, H.A., do you have any experience with the Wario games? Um, I played uh, a little bit of a, I, th- I think it was the GBA one um, years ago. But other than that, I don't I think I I really haven't. Um, I have exactly I, I, zero always, experience with them. Yeah, I, I've I've always like appreciated them, and I probably picked up like some of the others like just casually, like at a friend's place or something like that. But not I've never owned one myself. Mm-hmm. So I'm hoping that this one hits. Uh, we also got to see an extended look at Shin Megami Tensei 5, uh, which didn't do a whole lot for me, but I know, Nathan, you are definitely looking forward to. I've been waiting for SMT5 for a while. It's the kind of the reason I bought a Switch, um, because it was mm-hmm. revealed in the first Switch event. Yeah. Um, uh, for people who aren't familiar, as uh, Shin Megami Tensei is where the Persona series came from. In fact, Persona was a spinoff of it was initially labeled Shin Megami Tensei uh, Persona. Yeah. For the original games. Um, and definitely they've outclipsed the popularity of the original series and now don't have that labeling whatsoever. Um, but they're hard. They are cool. I am very curious to get my hands on this one and see what it looks like. It does have a lot of the bones of persona. You're going to see persona enemies. Uh, you can recruit monsters to fight on your party instead of having party members the, like like characters the the your um the other things you fight will be your party members because you can convince them to join you and come with you at least that's how i think this is going to go based on what i'm seeing here so i don't know super cool once again this is a situation though where maybe the demo went on a little too long for people like cozy um and like do i really need an rpg to explain to me how elemental weaknesses work yeah at this point in day and age it's like, oh, check out this novel system, weaknesses. What? <laughs> sure. It's I played Pokemon. I get it. Exactly, yeah. Um, anybody who's played a game will underst- kind of understand how that works. So, like, this is not where you need to get into, like, mechanics of the RPG, but you need to make it look enticing for people like Cozy to want to play. And I don't think they did a great job with that. Mm. Yeah. Especially because, from what I gather, I mean, I don't really particularly i'm not really sticker stickler for visuals but people thought that the game didn't look particularly great visually but um i, I think it looks fine but th- that's just another thing that you know doesn't necessarily sell you on a game that especially one that has been development for such a long time yep uh yeah it, it's it's been out there a while i'm glad to finally see gameplay of it in action because that's really the first gameplay we've seen mm-hmm. um and it's supposed to be out later this year so fingers crossed it will be great uh, finally, uh, considering that Nintendo closed out their uh, Nintendo Direct presentation with it, I figure it would only be appropriate that we conclude our E3 discussion by talking a little bit about the new The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild 2 slash sequel slash we're not going to reveal what its subtitle is because it's a spoiler uh, gameplay trailer. Um, I'm not going to lie. I didn't really care for this particular trailer when it first aired, but it seems like Nintendo kind of did the trick showing off what they did because there have been a lot of speculative videos and threads and uh, whatnots over the past few days coming over every single detail in this trailer. And that's pretty cool. So shout out to them for doing that. What about you guys? Were you frazzle dazzled away when you first saw this or were you kind of left a little bit wanting? Wait, have I told you guys how I feel about Breath of the Wild? Uh, yeah, I, you can, you me, can but... eat shit, Nathan. Um, yeah, for the record, <laughs> Tucker, I'm not a fan of Breath of the Wild. <laughs> sure, He's a okay. piece of fucking garbage. I don't know why we podcast with. I'm a, anyway. Uh, well, I, don't know I can I'm... I can put it on the record that it's 
one of my favorite games of all time. So I, I yeah, okay. I'm on your you side are now time. going to replace Nathan. He is canceled. I don't that know. Is that I know. Sounds great. Nathan. I'm in. By the way, yep. I don't know that I'm on the same uh, like late wavelength as Nathan in hating Breath of the Wild, but I. Breath of the Wild 1 was not a game that resonated with me as much as I wish uh, it did. Uh, I kind of felt like I was remarking this on like a, a Discord server recently, like the Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword was like, I felt the worst way to execute a Zelda game that I want to play, whereas Breath of the Wild was the best way to execute a Zelda game that I don't want to play. I just felt sure. like it's emphasis on scrounging for resources, and I... weapon degradation, and you know, uh, stupid dungeons. weapon degradation. Feeling that kind of belongs really in Zelda. But I, but it's I do fine. really, I do really respect all the you know changes that it brought to the Zelda formula. It certainly shook things yeah. up, and I respect that. Yeah, um, I didn't, I didn't finish Breath of the Wild either of the two times that I played it because I got it on the Wii U. Uh, when switches were scarce uh, when that first came out and then I, I played almost all the way through it and then I got a switch bought it again and played not quite to the same length and then I got tired of it um, mm. I kind of wish I had I had gone all the way through it the first time um, but um, I enjoyed all, all of my time with it um, uh, watching okay watching that it's got things to say watching that trailer let's play it again um i i enjoyed the trailer right and i kind of like what it's what it's doing at first i thought they were gonna be like try and like with the with uh, skyward sword re-release coming out i thought they were gonna try and tie it more into that uh based on the flying stuff like like islands in the sky Mm, um one, one thing i wonder is if the entirety of the Breath of the Wild landmass, based on just based on scenes in this trailer, um, will be available in, um, like, to roam around in Breath of the Wild, like as it Breath of the Wild two as it was, or or like whatever changes they make, like, or if it's only going to be a select section of it, and then all these islands in the sky, um. It's it's it it's curious. I'm not. I, I don't know. We still Did have I make a lot any to sense do. there. Yeah, yeah, kind of. Like, like, will you be able to wander everywhere you were in the first game, plus this new yeah. area that they're including? Yeah. yeah. What will it be? The Pokemon Gold sequel to the mm-hmm. Red and Blue of the yeah. original. No, I, I think that's a great question. This trailer for me was exciting to see gameplay. But it was underwhelming in, in, I think, a lot of regards in terms of its length. It wasn't very short in terms of the, the very editing long, feeling. A little, or yeah, sorry, it wasn't yeah. very. It wasn't very long. Um, I think the the teases of things that we we did see in terms of new abilities for Link and the expansion into the sky are all very exciting. But we need to see more of them. We need to see to what extent the below ground exists or is changed. We need to see the dynamic of new traversal options and and things of that nature, because this game could be really fantastic balancing the Mm -hmm. uh, openness of the original Breath of the Wild with progression elements from from the other parts of the series, better dungeons, maybe fixing uh, the uh, weapon degradation to appease more fans. But I'm really excited for this game because the original is such a great foundation and and one of my favorite games of all time. But this trailer did not show what I wanted. And especially because we sit on that shot of Hyrule Castle floating in the air. That is a prime frame for a faded in game game name reveal. But they just didn't. And at that point, for the end of an E3 Nintendo Direct, ending on, yeah, it's coming out, but not for a year, a year and a half. That was underwhelming, and, and especially without a title drop. I, I, I really think they could have done better with this trailer, especially considering, think back to that January Switch presentation 2017, one of the best video game trailers of all time, in my opinion, with that pounding music and the gameplay and the characters and the world and everything. This was, this was certainly end well. All right. All right. I think we're good for Breath of the Wild. So that was everything, right? Oh, I think so. Yeah, there was also the uh, Bandai Namco presentation after this where they looked at House of Ashes, the Dark Picture, and all the series game. Because that's the game that everybody wanted to know about that they had. Yeah. Yeah, there's no other, you know, big franchise island or game that people care about now. 
Yeah, it, <laughs> kind of embarrassing considering that uh, House of Ashes had already been shown off uh, at E3 a couple times prior to that. But, hey, you know, yep. you, you, you got to do what you got to do if you want to do what you want to do. Oh, all right. Hold on a sec. Uh, we have Hello. an incoming uh, Twitch clip that we need to look at. Before. Yes. Okay, this was I, uh, provided to me by my this one. Yes, you should. Okay. And keep it in the, the in the the audio of the podcast and everything. Uh, this was sent to me by uh, my friend Ben. Ooh. All okay. right. Okay. Ben, you already made us very happy uh, on this podcast already, bringing Airborne Kingdom to consoles. Let's see if he can go two for two. Competitive space for sure. Speaking of competitive, Gregway, Freedom Ooh. Games established themselves again as a dev that makes family-friendly games that are fun. And the most anticipated one from their announcement goes to Airborne Kingdom. This Ooh. is the first one I will argue Ooh. about. Okay. What? Who yes. did, who did yeah. the dog sit? I was like, Aww. Come on. It's a great game. I'm not it knocking looks it. Awesome. To it the rescue. Really no good. love for To the Freedom Look Games. Look how cute they manager. Exactly. I... It had so too many good games. Many games. There were too many, many good games. For me, and I think for all of us, and even for our media friends, I think uh, Freedom Games was like a star of the show for us. Yes. Uh, so many great games from that group, and I'm so excited to see what they're going to be bringing in the future. Because now that they're on the map, I'm yeah. sure more people are going to be paying attention 100 percent, yeah and i think their presentation yeah. is so good so at developers as um, good for them. so i appreciate yeah, that uh, clip i'm i'm beginning to become a little bit worried that this podcast is just becoming the promotional arm of airborne kingdom i'm not gonna lie the checks don't worry the checks in the mail oh there we go i, I haven't received okay. a copy of that game yet so i don't know like i said the checks in the mail <laughs> I didn't receive a copy of that game. I bought that game because I support my favorite content creators. I'm trying to as do a Lucille Bluth. I'm trying to do a Lucille Bluth wink in the camera. R.I.P. Jessica Walters. Yeah, that's a good one. All right. Um, is that going to do it? I think, any, any? Uh, I think we're all oh, good. Uh, Oh, just a um, quick note for people. I will not be on the podcast next week. I will be recording and guesting on uh, three dads in a podcast. Absolutely. Ooh, That's exciting. Yeah. Or three dads That's in a console. Three dads in a console. I'll be um, on. So, yeah. Uh, I believe I'm on their show on the week, week after that. Oh, cool. Ooh, good for you. They have, they have a good PR team. Very over excited there. to talk to them. Uh, yeah. I, I do Tell also. Me. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, 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 Cozy, go, you go ahead. Uh, I do also want to mention, uh, you know, as we referenced multiple times throughout this episode, we did predictions prior to E3. Uh, we are going to be going over those predictions uh, with the help of a uh, another co-host uh, or possibly guest to help serve as the judge and judicator. I hope that that's an actual word, not just something I made up uh, to determine who truly won and lost our predictions. Uh, TBD on exactly when and how that's going to be happening. Again, considering that Nathan is going to be uh, guesting on another podcast next week. Uh, but know that we have not forgotten about that. We're just trying to figure out the best time and best way to do that episode. Also, it might make sense to let those predictions breathe a little bit more because we don't know what else events are coming. True. We yeah, still have the sure. uh, the EA event later on this month. Not part of E3, but just sort of doing its own thing. Well, it, it'll oh, be in it. July, and I assume yeah, we'll see July, a PlayStation right. event at some point. Problem is, is that you look at all the, the dates for all these events uh, on like a calendar or something, and it's like, you know, the, the Nintendo Direct, June, uh, the Namkai Bando presentation, June, the Capcom showcase, June, and then you have at the very end of it, uh, EA in July, and your brain goes, oh, you know, another month that begins with JU, must be in June. Nope. nope it's in July. <laughs> it all is right. what it is. <sighs> uh, Tucker, really quick, where, where can people find you? How, how can people keep up with you? Well, I would really appreciate if anyone here wants to continue hearing my voice, talking to me, uh, talk to me on Twitter. Uh, my my username is Zerky. It's T Z U R K I. It's hard to pronounce. I've been thinking about changing it, but it's like it's similar to, to Tziki, but to Zerky. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, and also, so, uh, please, I'd love it. Uh, subscribe to Backlog Banter because we make a lot of videos there, and um, we're very. I'm very active at responding to comments, and I love meeting anyone who wants to talk about games, talk about movies, talk about comics, anything that I'm into. Uh, and especially, you know, great, great people like you. I love meeting anyone in this sphere. So hit me up. I, I don't, I don't have a lot going on in my life and I'd love to talk about anything that I'm, that I'm interested in. I've, I've got a wide variety of, of movie tastes and game tastes. So 
Perfect. Uh, absolutely. Awesome. Thank you Sounds for coming good. on, Tucker. We really do yeah. appreciate it. Thank you very I much. Absolutely. Thank you. You've been absolutely fantastic. So um, yeah, and to everybody time. else out there, yeah, to everybody else out there, thank you for tuning in to this episode of Press YYZ. If you enjoyed what you just heard, please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, and follow us on Twitch. You can also check out Press YYZ on Twitter to stay up to date when we go live and join us on Discord at invite.gg slash press YYZ to keep the conversation going. Damn right. uh, next next week's topic of the show, uh, we already previously mentioned, we're going to be uh, reviewing and reacting to uh, everything that will have uh, come out. Yeah. No, nope. is that, that just that a copy would, from the last would, one? Yeah, I, 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 for the record, I did a lot of work setting up today's run of show document, but I believe I it. didn't do enough work because I actually yeah, missed left in it. a paragraph that shouldn't have been read. My apologies. I, I, I fumbled the beginning and it was my fault. <laughs> fumbled the end and I blame you, Cozy. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's uh, well, totally fair. We're all in. Next week's uh, topic of the show: TBA. Yeah, to be dot, determined. Dot, dot. We we will see. Until then, thank you for playing. Later, guys.